The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the first chapter. Glory to you, Lord. In those days, Mary set out and went with haste to a Judean town in the hill country, where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the child leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord comes to me? For as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. The Gospel of the Lord. When you are a girl or a young woman, the story of Mary and her divine pregnancy gets heard in a certain way. I'm not sure that how it's heard is actually how it's told, or even the intent, mind you. But for many girls, and probably boys too, there is a kind of awe, magic, and beauty that gets wrapped around Mary. And I, I love that image, and I love that innocent memory. I didn't know that Mary's story could be a heartbreaking one for those who never had children of their own, who had lost a child due to illness or some other tragedy, or who had suffered miscarriages. I didn't know that while others were gleefully belting out joy to the world and welcoming the Christ child, that there were others who were quietly and somewhat guiltily resenting his birth and the ridiculous ease at which Mary becomes pregnant. I didn't know all of those things. And I know them now, and I can't unknow them. I can't hear the story in the same way ever again, and I, I wish I could, but one doesn't lose a baby and not know at a gut-wrenching level that pregnancy and birthing are fraught with apprehension, complications, and fear, and that life is very, very fragile. The underscored part of Elizabeth now makes so much more sense to me, and I am so glad that she is in the story. Who knows how many years she and Zachariah tried to have children? Who knows how many miscarriages and stillbirths they had? Who knows how many dreams they buried? Because history doesn't tell us that. I am guessing that she and Zechariah had stopped dreaming that dream long before she was unable to physically conceive. Because at some point, you just have to stop believing that you can be like every other woman around you. It's too painful. Well, in my younger, more naive days, I assumed that Elizabeth was filled with joy and excitement, that this gift had finally come to her, and she could hardly keep the secret to herself. But now I know better. It makes sense to me that Elizabeth wants nothing more to keep the pregnancy to herself. The Bible tells us that she stays secluded for five months. Nobody else, save her husband, who is mute, so he can definitely keep a secret, <laughs> and the angel know of her condition. If something goes wrong, like every other time, she can quietly bear her pain and disappointment alone, and she doesn't have to endure the pity of family and friends one more time. Elizabeth knows that there's more to the what to expect when you're expecting book of life than people like to talk about. Elizabeth knows what weird, real pregnancy holds. She knows that any pregnancy has the potential for life and the potential for death. But then, as the months ticked on for Elizabeth, and this growing fetus sucked more and more of her life and energy, she had to be thinking this whole pregnancy thing is made for much younger, much more vibrant bodies than herself, probably somebody like her cousin Mary. I mean, what was she thinking? or more accurately, what exactly was God thinking? Pregnancy is not for the faint of heart. But unbeknownst to Elizabeth, Mary is pregnant too. Neither should be, but regardless of circumstance, they both find themselves with child. Mary and Elizabeth are surprising foils for one another. One informs the other. Elizabeth imparting wisdom and practicality. 
and Mary reminding Elizabeth of innocence and possibility. But no matter the woman, and if you're a woman, you know this, there is a strange kind of submission which happens when one discovers she's pregnant, even if the pregnancy is planned and wanted. She soon discovers that she's agreed to more than she's planned. Her life and her body no longer belong entirely to her, even in the first few months before anyone else knows of her condition. Her hormones determine which types of foods she can eat and which types of foods might just induce vomiting. Her freedom decreases as the baby increases, and it becomes harder to walk, painful to sit, and even exhausting to sleep. More and more of her life is released into this body which is growing inside of her. And yet this life doesn't really belong to her. It only belongs to itself, or maybe more accurately, to God. Well, as I said, pregnancy and all that it entails is not for the faint of heart, from conception to birthing to raising. No wonder Mary stayed with Elizabeth for three months. They hang on to each other for dear life, because life is about to change, and all of it is completely beyond their control. Because even though both of these hushed pregnancies will eventually become scandalous, scandalously public, they don't have anybody else. There was no excitement or baby showers thrown for these two women. There was no what to expect when you're expecting book for either of them to consult. And plus, from what I remember of the what to expect book, there are no chapters entitled, What to do when God is the Father. <laughs> but maybe there should be, because this actually seems to be the problem. The story of Mary and Elizabeth is one that proclaims, regardless of age or gender, regardless of status or race, that we are all favored by God. Apparently, anyone can become pregnant by God. A barely pubescent virgin and a post-menopausal woman are only the beginning. The What to Expect book relays factual information, but it doesn't tell you this truth. Whether you are Mary or Elizabeth, whether you are a man or a woman, whether you have ever, be call, ever been called mom or dad, in some very real ways, we are all impregnated by God, which includes all of you men out there also, because hidden in the most unlikeliest of places, God is growing the kingdom. So I thought a few chapter highlights from the much-needed book, What to Expect When God is the Father, are in order. So chapter one, morning <coughs> sickness. Don't be fooled by the title. When God is the Father, it's morning, afternoon, and evening sickness. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but it doesn't get progressively better as the months tick on. No, when God is the Father, the pain and hurt of the world will make your stomach, stomach turn with waves of nauseousness your whole entire life. Chapter 2, Cravings. No cravings for vanilla ice cream with pickles on top of it, but when God is the Father, the cravings and desires are just as fierce. Impregnated by God's Spirit, you'll long for justice and peace and often go to great lengths to satisfy your obsession by uplifting the poor and downtrodden, feeding the hungry and clothing the naked. But the good news is those cravings often satiate the morning sickness. Chapter 3, Growing Pains. When God is the Father, it's not your belly which expands with each passing day, but rather your heart. This can be amazing. You will most acutely feel the expanse within your chest cavity as your heart swells to almost capacity. Don't worry, the muscle is extremely elastic and will not burst, despite the fact that sometimes it is downright painful. When God is the Father, your heart recognizes all as your brothers and sisters, all as your children, even those with whom you fight, disagree, and even hate. This heart expansion allows you to see more goodness in the world and in others and readily meets the eye. Chapter 4, Labor and Delivery. Unfortunately, in this regard, the author can be of little help. When God is the Father, 
Each person's labor and delivery is unique and specific to each pregnancy. Some birthings are very messy and painful. Some are smooth and uncomplicated. Some result in life and some in death. But rest assured, when God is the Father, something beautiful always comes into being, even when it doesn't look that way. This is the gift of the resurrection and is covered in the subsequent book, What to Expect at a Funeral God Runs. What to Expect when God is the Father. Anything and everything. And what does God expect of you? Anything and everything. Just as Mary and Elizabeth were transformed by their pregnancies and not merely vessels through which babies passed, so too are we. Bearing life is fragile and unpredictable, and it may be a part of the Christmas story that we don't often talk about. But when we make room for God, he conceives himself within us, and it is then, too, that we experience the expectant kick of being close to the Spirit. We learn that the love growing within us is the truest thing we know, the truest thing there is, and everything else begins to fade away. Only God can say what this new thing, this new spirit is that's forming inside of you. Bearing God's child is not for the faint of heart, but your very life 